Okay, good morning. Um, so I've already learned a couple of things from our previous speakers. Alexander will know very well, of course. Um, he has explained that if you're an entrepreneur and as a co-founder of Tom Tom I am one, of course, you have to be a bit uh, strange. <laughs> so that's me. The other thing is, listen to your dad. And that's what I did. It was one of he, he gave me one of the big motivators to become an entrepreneur. Uh, it goes back to the previous speaker. So he worked his whole life in a large corporate. At some point in his career, two-thirds along the way of his working life, he was denied a promotion, a promotion he badly wanted. So he went to the HR department and said, I believe I can make that promotion. I have a right to that promotion. And they took out the files. Of course, this was the old-style files. And they, they looked at it and they said, no, sir, sorry, you can't do that. Well, why, why, why can't you do that? Well, for everyone at this company, we have a curve, a career curve. And uh, if, you, if we would give you the promotion, you would go above the curve. And uh, that doesn't work for us. But, and my father said, well, so, so what if I go above that curve? Well, they said, we've been around for 120 years. We have the statistics and the data and the analysis uh, to prove where you will end. And it always works. <laughs> when I heard that, I had no motivation to become a free person. <laughs> So indeed, I'm one of the uh, co-founders of uh, TomTom. When we started back in 1991, uh, for me, it was straight out of university. Uh, the environment was a bit different in terms of startups uh, as it is today. It indeed took us uh, a decade to really find our way, uh, pun intended. And it's really only from, uh, from the millennium where we started to grow the company really from 15 persons to uh, 5,000 uh, within a couple of years. Today we are a global company, we are in 37 countries, and we are firmly embedded in the mobility and in the automotive industry. And what I want to share today with you is, is the exciting future that we see ahead in the world of mobility, because big change is ahead. Now it all goes back, of course, to that day in 1886 when Carl Benz, when he fit an internal combustion engine on a carriage and he invented, or it was an innovation, had the automobile. And it brought massive change, of course. People suddenly could connect. It was great for commerce, it was great for industry, prosperity around the globe. But it was slow going. It took a couple of decades for the automobile to become available as a proper commercial package. It took Henry Ford, of course, to bring uh, mass production. And then it took into the 50s for, for the US, 60s in Europe, 70s in the tiger economies, had to get mass adoption of automobiles. And the automobile industry has been working hard all that time to make them cleaner, safer, better, all those kind of things. But it was slow going. Now we're at the verge of, of big change in that whole industry. And I want to talk about that uh, today with you and tell you why I am so excited to be in that industry. And I hope to see a lot of you in that industry as well, of course. So, let me take you to uh, London, to uh, Savoy Place, where we find um, the building, the headquarters of the Institute of Technology and Engineering. This is an association of scientists and engineers. They have members around the globe, and every couple of years they ask them to vote on what they think are the most important innovations in the world, have the biggest effect on society. Uh, so you'll find the automobile there, you will find... Um, lasers, internal combustion engine, batteries, those kind of very fundamental things that define the world uh, in terms of innovation as we know it today. And you will find uh, Graham Bell's um, phone at the bottom there. Of course, uh, if we move a bit further up, uh, the evolution to the mobile phone and the smartphone as we know it today. And obviously what makes us very proud at TomTom, Tom, in the middle there, the personal navigation device, which of course gave us our success. And the personal navigation uh, device, we launched that in 2004, so it took us a long time to get where, uh, to, to find a, a way of getting to that success. That was a big innovation. Now, today we've moved on enormously, but at the time, you know, navigation for cars already existed. The package and the route to market was wrong. So it had be, been around since the 1990s, 
um, stuck into a car. You could only get it when buying a new car as an accessory that you would choose would be around 4,000 euros. Black and white screen. Uh, you would lose the way because the maps were really bad. And we realized around this time that given the state of technology, if we would package it in a different way as a consumer electronics product and making it available to all cars essentially, finding a different route to market going through consumer electronics channels uh, and being able to talk about uh, a singular benefit to market that properly, uh, that really brought that success. And we can today uh, look back and say we democratized navigation. We also realized immediately that this was a temporary solution to a much longer term uh, problem. And we realized that this was just, this was going to happen for a couple of years and then there would be other solutions. And of course that has happened, although even today we still sell two to three million of these devices uh, every year. Uh, but uh, we already ten years ago started to, di to diversify towards the automotive industry, starting to speak directly to, uh, to businesses and uh, not only actually automotive industry, but also governments and other companies. Today we work with pretty much every car manufacturer in the world. You'll find our software, our location data, traffic information, etc. in the cockpits of a lot of cars. What you see here is the European car of the year, the Peugeot 3008. Uh, but also, if you have an iPhone, you know, we are in every iPhone, iPad and Mac on the world. If you open up the Apple Maps app, you press the I button for information, you'll see our proud logo sitting there. And that's because Apple chose us for the location data and the traffic information. Similarly, and next time you take an Uber, that driver knows where to get you, where to deliver you, thanks to us and thanks to our location data. And then one other uh, big sport that we're good at is uh, tracking and tracing of uh, vehicles, of trucks and delivery vans. We are the number one in Europe, 800,000 trucks and uh, delivery vehicles. We are number three in the whole of the world. So that is what we do today, how we diversified our business. A lot of people think about that little thing on the windshield. Yeah, that was a great start. We use that to develop into a company that is fundamental today in that world of automobility. Why do I say that? Because everything that we do is built on a global digital roadmap. Tens of millions of kilometers of road that we know everything about, and where we know everything about traffic information, petrol prices, and those kinds of things, and that we keep up to date in real time. This is something that is not for the faint of heart. The barrier to entry is really high. There are only three digital global roadmaps in the world. Google, of course, have one, which they use to profile you, uh, to ultimately sell better uh, ads. Then the German car industry uh, has a map. And there's us. So it's no wonder that we do business with practically every car manufacturer in the world. The um, digital roadmap of, the, of the, the world, it is essential to our future. Today, still only one in five new cars have a map built in. And this over the next decade, decade and a half is going to go to 100%. A lot of change is ahead of us, and that's why we're super excited to be in this business. And why do we see that change coming? And the transformation of mobility, that is what we call it in the industry, that is because we have to. The way Carl Benz made us move around the world comes at a great cost. And let's start with pollution. In urban areas, anywhere between 50 and 90 percent of the pollution, or the visible stuff, smog, the invisible stuff, microparticles, comes from cars. One-fifth of the greenhouse uh, global warming effects comes from cars. Clearly, big costs to our environment, big costs to our health, and it needs to change. Next, the cost of capital. In the Western world, privately owned cars sit idle on average 94%. This is for Europe, this is for North America. So not 49%, 94%. All that capital, and there's a lot of capital that goes into cars, sits idle there on the road, is not being used. In a Western household, up to 15% of household income is spent on that car, including, of course, also fuel and those kind of things. That is a big cost to society. And imagine if you can free up uh, that money that's invested in those vehicles. We're freeing up trillions and trillions of dollars, euros, and, and other good money. And then there is the cost to human lives. Every year around the globe, one and a quarter million people die. Every year again. So let's take one and a quarter million people and we put them in city buses. That still means that every day, 
50 of those buses drive off a cliff. Now let's move one and a quarter million people into jumbo jets, 747s. Every day, 10 jumbo jets would be falling out of the sky. And if that were the case, if we would have those city buses, if we would have those uh, airplanes falling out of the sky, there would be a lot of regulation, a lot of safety measures. But hey, with uh, cars, it's different. And if you look at the stats on, uh, on, on, on traffic accidents, specifically on fatalities, these are the uh, Dutch figures. They're very similar to, for example, the US figures and, 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 and other countries around us. And what we uh, see is very interesting statistics. The industry has been working very hard on making driving safer. Government has been working on a lot of regulation. Uh, but if you go from left to right from 1950 to around now, uh, we're looking at, uh, at, at a time when, when we're looking at cars of tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands. And to the right, of course, it's, it's millions of cars on the same road. So having the uh, graph go down is very, very impressive. Uh, but there are a couple of interesting things. So uh, until around 1970, yeah, you could uh, uh, drive under influence. It was all good and the number was going up. Then that became forbidden and we got uh, all kinds of safety things like ABS. We got, uh, and that's something that we're proud of, of course, around 2004, 2005, a sharp dip because of the massive introduction of uh, navigation systems allowing people to concentrate on the driving. Uh, but uh, despite that, we now see the curve going up again. And uh, that is mostly attributed to distracted driving. And in the US, uh, where they do a lot of research in this area, they now think that 10% of uh, people dying in traffic is due to distracted driving. The number is growing 10% every year. So still, at the cost to us as society, it costs to us as individuals of, of the way we move around today with cars is very high and it has to change. And of course, we are looking to innovations in tech uh, to make that change happen. So let's look at pollution first. At, especially, of course, at making sure we don't have those uh, emissions anymore. So electrification of cars is going to happen on a massive scale. We've seen, of course, uh, the first experiments over the last couple of years. Hasn't been a big success. I'll get into why in a second. Uh, but if you look at making available the sources of those electricity, uh, making them renewable, going to green electricity, that is where you know, I'm a very uh, big optimist. Of course, we are, we are more in wind turbine area, but if you look at solar, that is going very fast. The efficiency of panels going up, rollouts of the number of panels is going very fast. And what we see is that in a number of areas in the world, solar electricity is now the same price of uh, carbon electricity. That is good, and it's coming down. The expectations are that by 2025, prices will have halved. By 2035, again, half to that. So we will have abundant green energy at very, very low prices. Good news and a reason to be very positive and a reason to carefully look at the opportunities in this area. Now, if you look at the cost of electrical vehicles, uh, we know from, uh, from, from a number of subsidy schemes, California, Norway, Holland, and that uh, consumers are happy to buy an electrical vehicle, uh, despite, of course, your range and recharging and those kind of things, but they're happy to buy one if they can buy it at price parity uh, compared to an old-fashioned dirty car. So, uh, and, and we know what happens if, uh, if, if, if they're more expensive. In Holland, we had a program where they were made affordable compared to, uh, to classic cars. That made them a success. We stopped that program and, and the other sales of e-vehicles are completely off the cliff. In Norway, it continues. And so we need to get those cars to the price. The determining factor in the price of an electrical vehicle are the batteries. They are expensive. So they need to get uh, more affordable. The price of those batteries is a function of you know, the capacity that you can store in them. And this graph is, comes from uh, the US DOT, Department of Transportation, where they've done a couple of studies. And the, the change in battery technology is going very slowly. It's glacial speed, I would say, but there, there, is, there are advancements. And they think that by 2025 or 2022, there will be the technology that allows us to make those batteries in such a way that we can create those e-vehicles at the same price. And it will come to the market a couple of years later. So by the mid of the coming decennium, and we should see 
uh, uh, proper mass adoption by consumers of e-vehicles. I think businesses will be earlier because businesses tend to look at the total cost of ownership. And then the fun part really starts because fundamentally making an electrical car is much easier than making a, an internal combustion engine based car. You know, 150 years of German engineering in a very complex engine like that, you replace that with an electrical coil, mo coil motor, uh, and then you start taking out all kinds of other things that are there for the operator of the car, i.e. the driver, and you can see that it becomes much simpler. And you can also see how that will offer opportunities for new entrants into that market, new car manufacturers that might be the same companies that today are manufacturing your iPhone or your HP printer. And so change is coming and, and with a lot of opportunity. And then thinking about you know, safety and, and, and the cost of capital. The, uh, if you start thinking about self-driving cars with all the AI and computer vision that comes with that, there is a big expectation that at some point it will be much safer to drive in a car like that uh, than without. And then you start thinking about the whole electrification and making these self-driving vehicles. And then you can see they are in the far future uh, where you will be able as an individual to order A to B transport just with a click on a button on your iPhone or probably it's going to be a voice or direct brain interface at that time. Have a personalized A to B transport with a car that you don't own, that is owned by an operator, by a government or an Uber or whatever, and it will pick you up, drop you off where you need to be. It will open up access to this type of transport to a lot of people that don't have to today. Children, the elderly, uh, and, and people with disabilities. It will be cheap, it will be uh, affordable, it will be available, and that is where this whole industry is going to. Now, a lot of people, of course, ask me, you know, when is this going to happen? And it won't happen over. There won't be that day when we wake up and say, oh, now we sit in this beautiful future. Of course, we will see self-driving happen much earlier on the highways, where it's easier, where you have clear lines and separation of traffic. Another area where I believe it will happen quite early is actually in dense urban areas where traffic is very slow, where that car can take time to make decisions and where there's a big economical reason uh, to roll it out. If you look at the Ubers and the Lyfts and, uh, and this kind of scenario that we're thinking about. And we think that one of the biggest uh, factors in, in the speed of adoption actually is going to be the regulator, our governments. Uh, the, every time there's an accident uh, at this moment, you see uh, the, the, the people responsible for the rules and all that stuff, they get very, uh, very nervous. But there's another thing. The, Industry, the automotive industry that exists today employs millions and millions and millions of people. Not specifically in the Netherlands, but think about a country like Germany or France or the UK or the US or Japan. Millions of jobs that are going to change in the next decade, fundamentally change. And if you think about the future like this where the self-driving cars will park themselves out in big buildings outside of cities, uh, you know, it means we don't need dealer networks, we don't need petrol stations, uh, infrastructure is going to be built differently, uh, insurance has to change, and so uh, the, a lot of change is coming, and there will be places, areas, countries that have vested interest and uh, for probably all the right reasons need to protect a lot of jobs of people that will try to slow this down, giving at the same time opportunity to other people who are not held back by these vested interests, to find the new business models, to find the new technologies, and to make these changes happen. And I think in Holland, we're kind of in a situation that we have all these neighbors with these particular interests. We have a very strong industry in supplying the automotive industry, but I think we have an opportunity to be at the forefront of these, of these changes. So at TomTom, Tom, of course, we do a lot of uh, stuff uh, on the future, make all the investments, so we are and making our maps ready, we're making them into high definition maps that are much more complex than a regular road map that help those vehicles uh, uh, really localize themselves within um, centimeters precision and that use LiDAR and computer vision and AI to make all of that possible. We are in fact uh, building our own self-driving car. And, and, and we are not going to be a car manufacturer, but we want to have the whole stack of software, of data, content, AI, and to show to the world that it is possible. And of course, we want to deal with all the car manufacturers uh, that, uh, that could make their cars self-driving in that way. And then if you think about you know, what really makes us tick is, 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 is the whole ecosystem of cars that feed data into our map. 
and that we then look at, we improve the map, and we feed it back. So we get that for every time we every time we do a deal with a company, we ask data back. So with Apple, but also with with uh, Mercedes, and, and we track billions of people. We track between half a billion and a billion individuals in the world. We do that on an anonymous basis. We are not interested, you as an individual, we are interested in the behavior of the road network. And that uh, gives us uh, some real big, big data. So today it is just GPS positions that we are tracking at a certain time and it gives us of course, knowledge about real-time traffic situations, changes in the network. In our warehouse, data warehouse, we have over 20 trillion data points right there. That is, that is not big data, it's big, big data. And a trillion uh, is, is one with uh, 12 zeros. Every day we add 10 billion uh, data points to that. So we know what's going on out there. And then here, it's hard to see, but here we are redrawing the map of Berlin. So every 1.6 seconds we go around the equator in terms of measurements. A city like Berlin, 15,000 kilometers of road, we map every 15 minutes, again and again. So this is, uh, you know, this is big data, AI and IoT at work, all at the same time. And as we now go ahead with cars getting smarter, cars getting more sensors, LiDAR, radar, computer vision, and we're starting to ingest more and more data, and our knowledge of what's happening there in real time uh, is, uh, is, is deepening and the details are going up. And then again, we feed that back to that car. Sorry, go back. Okay, it won't go back. We feed that back into the car of the future, giving them a, a, what we call an artificial horizon, allowing that people, uh, that, sorry, that car that can only look straight, just like us with our eyes, to look around the corner and see that there's a red light there, three cars waiting, better start braking now, that kind of stuff. And that in itself, that whole virtual representation of the world, of the world's road networks, of course, generate new opportunities for other businesses where we start looking at smart cities, where we can help uh, the owners of the infrastructure manage use of that infrastructure, where uh, we see, uh, for example, with our uh, cooperation with uh, Microsoft and uh, Azure, making it very easy for a lot of different app builders to start doing stuff, and of course working with car manufacturers. Uh, and for us, we're super excited to be in the industry. In the next 10 years, more will happen, more will change than in the last 100 years. And here I've only been talking about the transformation and touch on the transformation of mobility, but there's a transformation of energy. And there's these big patterns that are happening in the, couple of, in the years ahead. You know, migration, uh, urbanization, and that means a lot of change. And change means a lot of opportunity. And we happen to be in a great place in Holland, uh, where we have great infrastructure, we have great internet connectivity, we have an open and connected economy. And uh, we have... Uh, if you look at the mobility sector, we have a large industry which mostly is supplying to the, uh, to the automotive industry, but a lot of knowledge and uh, uh, knowledge there. Also in terms of uh, academic institutions, think about uh, the University of Eindhoven, for example, sitting in the middle of um, uh, the big uh, group of uh, companies in that area. Then we have... Now we have a couple of great examples in, in Holland of, of tech companies that, uh, that managed to come out of this place. Of course, yeah, there's, there's TomTom, but also think about Booking, think about Agen, think about Elastic, think about uh, etc. There's a longer list. And, and that's because we actually do have an environment where we nurture our startups, where we give the opportunities to the startup, where we can make them grow, where we can make them scale up. And so I hope I've given you a little bit of inspiration, you know, entrepreneurialism is important. We at TomTom Tom and those others, we have warmed this place up. Now it's to you, the young people, to the entrepreneurs, the innovators and the scientists uh, to make this spot hot. Thank you. <laughs>